The following is an encore presentation of a pre recorded program. To join one of our many live presentations, please visit cje.net slash events, call 773-508-1000, or follow us on your favorite social media platform. I'm the manager of Counseling Services. We host these monthly community education programs um, called Insights on Aging. Today we have um, as our guest speaker, Margaret Danilovich, who will do a complete introduction of herself in a moment. I just wanted to be sure to get us kicked off. Welcome everyone into the room. We're so happy you're here. I know you're going to be thrilled with Margaret's presentation. I want everyone to know we're on a, a little different uh, software than we've used in the past. This is a webinar software, so people aren't visible to one another but you are able to access the Q&A. So please do put questions in as Margaret's talking. She's gonna get to all of those questions at the end of her program. Um, we'll try and address everything we can before we wrap up. Margaret will take like the last 15 minutes of the program and touch base with you all. So, so get the questions in there as you're listening to the presentation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Margaret. Thanks so much, Roseanne. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. And while I'm pulling that up, um, I'll just sort of briefly introduce myself. I'm the Senior Director of the Research Institute here at CJE Senior Life. Um, I'm a physical therapist by background. Um, and my clinical career has all been in the area of older adults and long-term care. My research focuses on exercise and, and health promotion interventions for older adults. Um, so really thrilled to be here to talk about something that I think is sort of an under-recognized and under-addressed topic in aging, which is how do we recognize and reduce the risk of delirium? So we'll get started here with a little artwork to begin our morning. Um, so again, as Roseanne mentioned, you can feel free to put in questions in the uh, Q&A box as we go. But as you're looking at uh, these paintings here, it, it might be a familiar artist. This is Vincent van Gogh. And what this shows is a series of self-portraits that he did over a number of years. So we want to note a couple of different things. One, Pay attention to sort of stylistically how the art changes, you know, sort of more of a traditional approach to the influence of impressionism. Um, and you might be wondering now, like, I'm here for a health talk. Why are we talking about artwork? And the reason is this. When we look at his later self-portraits shown here, around picture 23, 24, 25 is when Van Gogh, what we now think suffered from is delirium. And so this is really reflected in his artwork. It's reflected in sort of a more abstract style. And, and we can really think about the, the impact that this delirium has on a person. So uh, one of the things that we know about Van Gogh is that he suffered from alcoholism. So this is one of his paintings of absinthe at a cafe. And in retrospect, what is now believed is that because of alcohol withdrawal, he suffered from delirium. And that episode of delirium is actually what triggered him to cut off his ear. So the first takeaway I have for you today is that we really want to appreciate delirium as a medical emergency. So this is a, a very severe condition. It's a medical emergency. This is not just saying, oh, this person is confused. Rather, this is saying this person is confused. They're exhibiting behavior that is different from normal, and we need to address this. So I want to take a moment to think about how delirium differs 
from two of the other D conditions that we more commonly think about in older adults, or perhaps more attention is given, dementia and depression. So briefly, when we're thinking about dementia, we're thinking about someone that has memory impairment. This is something that happens over many years. It's a chronic, progressive, slow disease course. And the reason we talk about this is that some of the associated symptoms we see with dementia and depression have overlaps to delirium, disorientation, agitation, and disturbed sleep. In contrast, depression we think of as more sadness, loss of interest in, in others and your surroundings. This can also be something that is a chronic condition. It can be a single episode. And we see, again, similar symptoms, disturbed sleep, agitation, potentially, um, or feeling the opposite of agitation, this apathy, and some disorientation or cognitive impairment. In delirium, the important symptoms we want to think about are that this is a fluctuating level of consciousness. So I might feel much more cognitively sound and, and sort of in a right frame of mind. And then I have a, a change in my, disor in my orientation levels and sort of how I am doing cognitively. Importantly, and what distinguishes delirium from dementia is that this is an acute onset. And because it's an acute onset, this is sort of the, uh, the necessity of this being a medical emergency. Something is happening that is changing my cognition. It's changing my orientation. I need to address that underlying medical cause because that's an emergent situation. Our associated symptoms are disorientation, visual or auditory hallucinations, um, people might feel very withdrawn and sort of a hypoactive delirium. They're going to have impaired memory and attention and also some disturbed sleep. Um, so delirium really is this confusion and shown by the artwork here um, by an anonymous artist. It's this concept of, of hallucination. So this person in the artwork here is in the hospital bed. They see a nurse, but the nurse has like sort of wings on them. There's a large spider on the wall. There's trees growing in the hospital rooms, things that obviously should not be there. And that's the hallucination. So our, our definition of delirium is this acute and fluctuating onset of confusion, disturbed attention, disorganized thinking and or a decline in the person's level of consciousness. Why does this occur? We know there's two sort of probable reasons. One is that there's an actual direct insult or injury to the brain. And the second sort of theorized cause is that we have an unusual stress response in our body. And a normal stress response leads to the release of hormones. When we have an exaggerated stress response, our hormone levels sort of get all out of whack and that can actually change what's happening in our brain. So from a direct sort of brain insult, um, it can be things like, I don't have enough oxygen to my brain. Our brain is fueled by glucose, sugar. If you have not enough glucose coming to your brain, your brain is not going to be able to survive and it's going to cause direct damage to our brain tissue. So we need blood flow, we need oxygen, we need nutrients in the form of glucose. If we don't have those, if there's a disruption in our metabolism, our brain tissue is going to die. As our brain tissue dies, it actually kills away sort of and, and lowers our levels of neurotransmitters, which are substances in our brain that allow our brain to, to work and communicate signals. So we have these sort of uh, direct insults that can occur. We have cells in our body that are uh, dopaminergic and cholinergic, and they're all required to respond and function. So as our brain gets impacted through the lack of oxygen and blood flow and glucose, 
this can actually cause cell death leading to delirium. The second sort of hypothesis way is this ag uh, exaggerated stress response. So when we're under periods of stress, we've all been there. We feel sort of a, a, a fight or flight response. Sometimes we might feel a little bit more tense. What we're feeling is sort of driven by increased levels of cortisol in our body. So that's a normal thing. I'm, I'm anxious about something, I'm stressed, my cortisol levels increase. But that should be temporarily. When the stressor goes away or when I'm better able to say, okay, I've got this, my cortisol levels go down. When we are under abnormally long periods of intense stress, those hormone levels go up and they stay up. And what we know through research is that as we have more of this cortisol levels, we actually have higher levels of inflammation. And inflammation is normal. So if I uh, you know, sprain my ankle or get a paper cut, we have an inf uh, inflammatory response that occurs at that level of injury to allow for healing. But once healing starts, the inflammation goes away. When we have lots of inflammation going on all the, pro all the time and it doesn't go away, it actually damages our neurons, which are sort of the, the um, connection point from our brain to our body. As we have reduced function of that connection, we're losing our cognitive function. And so delirium can result. Delirium occurs in about 10 to 15% of all people who are admitted to the hospital. When people have more severe critical illness and they might be in the intensive care unit, it, delirium will affect about 30% of those patients up to 75% of older people. So anyone over the age of 65. So really importantly, we need to be aware that delirium adversely affects those with increasing age. So among everyone in the United States that are 60 to 64, about 1% of those people will have delirium in, in a year. But when we look at people who are 85 and above, it's anywhere from 30 to 50%. So this is a big problem for us as we get older that we need to be aware of. Our mnemonic for the causes of delirium is a little morbid, um, but it's a good way to sort of think about what are all of those triggers, why someone might get delirium. And our mnemonic is, I watch death. So these causes of delirium are usually causes that lead us to be hospitalized, but they can also happen to us sort of at home without a hospitalization. So infections of any kind can be a risk factor for delirium. Like Vincent Van Gogh, withdrawal from drugs or alcohol can be a, a trigger for delirium. Any metabolic diseases, trauma. So that can be both physical trauma or psychological trauma, any central nervous system disease. Um, so multiple sclerosis, uh, brain cancer, any of those kinds of diseases predispose someone to be more at risk. Hypoxia or the lack of oxygen, that's our direct brain insult. I don't have oxygen coming to my brain, my brain cells and tissue die, I'm more likely to be, uh, have delirium. Nutritional deficiencies. This is probably the number one thing that we see outside of the hospital. So it's um, any kind of like vitamin nutritional de uh, deficiency from just kind of not the best diet, but probably most importantly for people is um, being dehydrated. So having that deficiency in your hydration levels can actually be a, a cause for this acute confusion. Environmental, so this is particularly in the hospital, someone who is 
in the emergency room. Then they moved to floor seven. Then they moved to the eighth floor. Then they moved to the fourth floor. And they're moving around all the time. That is actually very disorienting. So we have to be cognizant of a lot of transitions can actually sort of make us more at risk to getting delirium. Um, if we have sort of acute on, sudden onset vascular problems, a stroke, a, a TIA, things of that nature, um, having toxins or drug use, and heavy metal poisoning are all of our causes of delirium. So looking at some more of these risk factors for, for delirium, uh, when we look at um, kind of the conditions that would predispose us to getting delirium in the hospital for people over the age of 65, dementia, the severity of the illness, having visual impairment. That means, you know, not just having sort of some element of, of visual loss or blindness, but even just having glasses and contacts is, is sort of a visual impairment. Uh, getting a, a catheter in the hospital and the longer you stay, these are all associated with odds ratios um, greater than one, which means if you have this, like if you have dementia, your odds are 6.62 higher of having delirium in the hospital than someone without dementia. We also know that there's a number of predisposing factors, people that are older, people that have some degree of dementia at baseline. Um, if you have a past history of delirium and this on, uh, acute confusion, you're more likely to have it again. People that have any kind of depression, um, people that are using multiple medications, these will predispose you to getting delirium in the hospital. So the, our take home message is, if this is you, or this is someone that you care for, or a loved one, we want to sort of file that away in the back of our mind to say, you know, if my dad goes to the hospital, he's over 70, he has a visual impairment, I need to be thinking and maybe just watching out for this. And then there's also these precipitating factors, things that make our delirium worse. If people are on restraints, if they have a whole lot more medication that they are prescribed in the hospital, that can have a very dramatic effect on our cognitive health especially as we're older, because we process medications out of our body much more slowly. And so we're much more likely to have medication interactions and that leads to delirium. People that have pain, that are coming out of surgery, people that are under anesthesia or people with sort of malnutrition and dehydration, which happens in the hospital. Because if you're having surgery, what's the first thing they say? Don't eat for you know 12 hours before surgery. So people come into surgery at a level of dehydration and malnutrition. So we, we put people on IV fluids to give them the hydration they need, but for particularly older individuals, everything is a bit more of a, a fine balance. And so we can become clinically dehydrated very, very rapidly. So our model of, of delirium and, and really a model of aging we might wanna think about is that let's think of a balloon, a brand new shiny balloon. You stretch it and it pops right back. The integrity of the structure is really sound. As we age and we accumulate more stressors, meaning I age and I accumulate more chronic medical conditions or I've been exposed over a longer period of time to things like stress, environmental toxins and pollution. I have a poor diet, but I've had a poor diet for 40 years. And so I have the cumulative impact of that. Our balloon expands. Well, as a balloon expands, what happens to the integrity of, of the, the rubber and the structure? It sort of stretches out and it doesn't bounce back as much. 
So in this balloon model, we start here, we add in our stressors, the balloon is expanding, expanding, and eventually one of these sort of predisposing factors happens. We are undergoing surgery, we get a catheter, we have to take all sorts of new medications, and our balloon pops. And that is really a model of how we can think about how delirium occurs. That popping is the onset of acute confusion, and it's a medical emergency because what's going to happen to that balloon? All the air is going to flow out, and the balloon is going to just fall to the ground, and we have to throw it away. So we need to intervene really rapidly to patch that hole and to solidify the walls of that balloon and ensure that people live in good health. Um, so again, our, our signs and symptoms here, we want to think about this is a sudden hours to days onset. Importantly, this is our, our big take home point. The course of delirium is reversible with treatment, so we have to treat it. We're going to see fluctuations in cognition that occur over a 24 hour period and tend to be worse at night. People are going to have these fluctuations in their alertness, their cognition, their perceptions of the environment. One of the examples of that I see, or I've heard is a person with delirium who said, you know, the, the nursing staff would come in and put things in his room and he thought they were putting down a bomb in his room. But really they were just putting in medical supplies that were needed in the room. And so that perception is distorted. We see a number of different sleeping patterns, but there's really no set pattern for how sleep is disrupted. Um, and then emotionally, we're going to see fluctuations here too. Someone might have outbursts, they might have episodes of anger, crying, fear. So it's, it's a sudden onset and it's very different than the person's baseline. Um, so our, our key symptoms or key signs we're gonna think about and see are sort of these mispercep misperceptions and illusions. It, it think back to that picture of the person in their hospital bed and they saw the nurse, but the nurse had on wings or there's sort of this like spider on the wall. These are our delusions and hallucinations. And there's altered levels of arousal. So people can be anywhere from almost comatose to such profound agitation that they can't sit down, they can't stop talking, they can't stop moving. So you're gonna see a wide array of sort of the person's arousal level. I wanna take a moment to read a quote, and this is from someone who experienced delirium in the hospital. And what this person said was, I was frightened on several nights by the appearance of eerie children at the foot of my bed with long black wavy hair flowing down their backs. They never turned to face me, but moved very slightly, almost turning towards me. They were very sad as they had been exiled and would never return home. Made of chocolate, they were part of an exhibition to illustrate a myth that two self-congratulatory consultants or physicians had arranged. Despite shouting at them, they never acknowledged my anger at their irresponsibility. So what this person experienced and what this person felt was so real and so vivid. And this person was trying to interact with what they knew to be in that environment. But what we might see as an observer is, why is that person shouting at something that's not in the room? So as, as a loved one observing the person with delirium, what we might really see is the sense of fear, panic, and anger. And I think it's really important for us to see why. Like that would scare me if at night I saw children at the foot of my bed that were made of chocolate. I would be terrified, like thinking and knowing that something is not right, but it's so real. And so I think 
we need to really approach sort of this, this concept of delirium with understanding where the person is at, that this is so real to them that we need to really intervene to help them because it is a terrifying experience. So we get this vicious cycle because what we can see sort of in this case is that here's this person in the hospital bed and they are shouting at someone that doesn't sort of exist. Um, they're probably getting more angry. And so what is the sort of hospital course going to be? It's gonna say, let's restrain that person. They're, they might be at a, a danger to themselves. So we really need to intervene to make sure they don't hurt anyone. Or unfortunately, we might see, oh, that person's just crazy. We need to over-medicate them and sedate them. And so that, those actions that in, occur in our hospital system don't serve to make the person any better. They're treating those neuropsychological symptoms and expressions of delirium, but they're actually making the delirium worse. So our role as a loved one, working with or caring for someone who might be expressing these signs of delirium is to be both a detective and an advocate. First is that we really need to think like a detective and understand using our mnemonic of I watch death is there some kind of change that has occurred in this person that might be a trigger for delirium that we could alert the medical team to say, hey, just so you know, my loved one recently experienced X. So I need to, uh, this is different from their usual sort of state of mind. We need to investigate this. The second role for us is, as caregivers, as loved ones, as supportive people, is to be an advocate. Too often, delirium goes under-recognized and under-diagnosed. Because if I'm someone working in the hospital and someone comes into the emergency room and they're showing sort of this disordered thinking and understand and, and difficulty sort of understanding with confusion, it would be very easy to attribute those signs to the person has dementia. And, and because there's a lot of overlap, the chief difference being this time course, we need to advocate to say, hey, medical team, this is something new. This is not how my loved one normally is. This has happened in the last 24 hours. We need to be thinking about delirium. So our role as loved ones has to be as detectives and to be advocates because this is an underrepresent, uh, sort of underdiagnosed and, and sort of underappreciated cause of cognitive changes, particularly among older adults and particularly among people who cannot advocate for themselves. So if I am undergoing delirium, I know something is wrong potentially, but what I see in my hallucinations is so real, I truly think that that's what's going on in the environment. So it's not like I, as the person with delirium, can say, hey guys, I've got delirium, something's wrong. I am panicked and I'm fearful, I'm angry, I don't know what's going on because it is so truly real in my life. So our role is detective and advocate. There are three types of delirium we want to be aware of. The first one is hyperactive delirium. This is the person who is completely restless. They can't sit down. They're walking the halls. They are talking a mile a minute. When you go to them and say, okay, let's sit down, they're combative. They might have more hallucinations. Their delusions are, are present. This tends to happen in younger people. So this is kind of the, the common presentation we might see after trauma in, in younger people, after drug or alcohol withdrawal, um, but this is a, a more of the younger person's presentation. In contrast, the most common form of delirium among older adults is hypoactive. This is the person who is very lethargic. Their affect is very down. 
they just don't respond to questions with speed or with a lot of detail. You find this person sitting on the couch and they don't really move too much. They're just sort of sitting there. This is the form that gets so commonly misdiagnosed with depression because here's this older person and they just sort of are sitting there and they're not responding all that much. Um, and so as the healthcare provider, I think, well, maybe they're just depressed. That would make sense why they're not sort of engaged and why they don't really seem to want to do much of anything. So we put them on antidepressants. It's a new medication and it just makes things worse because underlying cause is this medical emergency of delirium. And then the third type is a mixed. So this is present in you know probably about 30% of cases where people will sometimes be a bit more hyperactive, sometimes a little bit hypoactive. Um, so those are the, our three different sort of major classifications. One of the screening tests that is done um, or is hopefully done in the hospital is called the four A's test. And this is a screening for dementia or delirium. And the reason I bring this up is because of our role as detective and advocate, advocate for our loved ones. We can use the four A's test as a way, as a structure to communicate with the medical team to say, these symptoms are not normal. This is not how my loved one normally is. It's not dementia, it's not depression. This is something else. This might be delirium. So we've gotta be the ones to get this on their radar. So our screening kinds of questions can be to think about the first day, alertness. So you know, looking for an ideal state is where the person is not agitated or not lethargic. So as our, our detective and advocate, we can say, my mom is much more agitated than she normally is. This is a different level of alertness. The AMT4 looks at, does the person know their age? Do they know their date of birth? Do they know where they are? And do they know their current year? So this is one of these where, um, you know, as people get older, and if we have a person that has some underlying dementia, we can be the advocates to say, you know, my, my parent, they never knew those questions. So, you know, that's not a change. Or to say, my parent knows where they are. They know their date of birth. They know their age. The fact that they can't do that now, that is something different and needs to be treated. Attention is usually measured from um, being able to state the months of the year backwards correctly. So again, looking for changes from our baseline normal levels. And then the time course. Delirium is an acute change. So it's happened in the last two weeks. Um, and, and so that's really the time that we want to really focus on. So if you're coming in and you're noticing these symptoms to alert the medical team to say, this is an acute onset. This is something new. This is not how my loved one normally is. Our strategies for management are as follows. We want to suspect it. We want to spot it. And we want to stop it. So we should be suspecting if there's an acute confusion um, that delirium might be at play for someone that's over 75 years of age, particularly if they have any baseline or sort of um, pre-morbid cognitive impairment. If people have visual or hearing loss, if they've had you know, recent surgery, pain, trauma, infection, all of those kinds of things, we need to say, hmm, something is not right here and this is probably what's causing it. So delirium is, our, is being suspected. We wanna spot it. We spot delirium by looking for acute confusion, difficulties concentrating and communicating. This is a behavior change. They're hallucinating. There's some fluctuations in how they're doing. That's when I say, yes, I think this person has delirium and we need to stop it. So like our balloon, we need to patch that hole 
to preserve the balloon's integrity, we need to treat the underlying cause. So if this is dehydration causing delirium, we need to get that person hydrated. They need IV fluids. They need to be monitored. We've got to treat the cause. If there's a medication that is causing cognitive impairment, we need to figure out which medication that is and get rid of it. I recently talked with someone whose um, father was put on all sorts of medications. And she just said, you know, we've got to, we got to stop this because he's just out of it. He can't communicate. He just sits in his room. He's not doing anything. So the medical team took him off all of his medications. And for the first time since even before COVID, he was actually able to feed himself lunch because he actually had the cognitive processes to do it. So before that, it was like the medication just completely depressed what he was able to do. So we've got to intervene and stop this. Importantly, what we can do as loved ones and as care providers is, is explain and reassure. So in contrast, perhaps, to when we have someone that has dementia, where we don't want to fight with them. If the person thinks it's 2005, we just sort of roll with the flow and go with this. Delirium is the exact opposite. We need to orient that person. So if I am going in and my parent has delirium, I'm going into the room and I'm saying, hey, mom and dad, today is Friday. It's August 13th. I'm putting up a big sign in the room to help them orient. I'm explaining all of the things that you're seeing. They are hallucinations. They are not real. I'm here. You're, we're going to keep you safe. It's about reassuring that person because they are undergoing so much fear. So our environment has to help orient the person. It's a constant orientation back to reality. We're ensuring that their physical, psychological, and social needs are met. So this is our, our key here, suspect, spot, and stop. Um, so really to emphasize our our stop it. We need to treat the underlying cause. We've got to be the advocates to say, this is not normal. Something is wrong. Medical team, you have to figure this out and address it. Um, oftentimes, we want to discontinue these medications. So particularly for older adults, it, we want to sort of discourage the use of benzodiazepines, narcotics, anticholinergics, sleep aids, all of those kinds of things, because they actually have a pretty significant impact on delirium. We're providing those orienting cues. So one of the things that happens in the hospital, or it can even happen sort of in any institutionalized setting, is that we draw our curtains. It's, we've got people coming in all days of, or all times times of the day. So the nurse comes in and is checking vital signs, you know, every three to four hours. It is very easy to lose track of what's night, what's day, and what time it is. So as a, an advocate, as a support person, we need to be there. We need to open the curtains up first thing and say, it's eight o'clock. We've got to get out of bed. We're, we're, it's nine o'clock. We're going to do this now. So we're providing those cues to tie in the person to what is reality in the world right now. Make sure people have their glasses and hearing aids. I stress this because unfortunately, this happens a lot. People fall in the middle of the night, they go to the hospital, and the, you know, in the chaos of all that, they don't have their hearing aids on. So it's really hard to orient yourself if you cannot see or hear. So we've got to make sure that people have those uh, pieces of, of assistive equipment to help them function. We really want to overhydrate. I would almost say that is the case for every single person. Push hydration and let people sleep. Help them get an, an established day and night cycle. And then the final part is to, to mobilize or move often. One of the best treatments we can do for people that are suffering with delirium is to get them up and have them walk. For one thing, it 
prevents them from laying in bed and being agitated. They're getting up and walking around. They're getting a sense of, I'm walking around the unit in the hospital. Okay, I see where I am. I'm understanding that I'm orienting to the place. But also importantly, is that we really think about sleep being driven by our activity during the day. So if I'm exercising and active, I'm going to sleep better. And that's going to go a long way to help regulate this day-night cycle. Uh, the, the sad thing and why we really want to stress this is that symptoms of delirium can persist for up to a year following the delirium diagnosis. And we know that people are worse off cognitively and physically. If people get delirium in the hospital, they're gonna stay there longer. They're more likely to get a blood clot or a pulmonary embolism. They're more likely to have a pressure ulcer. They're just not going to do as well. And particularly for anyone that also has a dementia diagnosis underlying this, it's, the delirium can actually accelerate the rate of memory loss. So this has significant impacts and that's part of why we really need to intervene so early and often um, for, these, for these individuals. So in summary, I'll leave you with what is good for delirium is also good for fall prevention, is also good for preventing functional de decline, and I would argue what's actually just good for healthy aging. So orientation strategies. During COVID, it's been very easy to say, oh, what day is it? Like, what's going on? Orient ourselves every day. Oh, yes, today is Friday. This is what's going on. Get our families involved. Uh, everyone over the age of 65 should think about making sure they do a medication reconciliation every year with their pharmacist or doctor to avoid potentially inappropriate medications that can worsen delirium, but can just also worsen overall health in general. The role of exercise, mobilization cannot be stressed enough. This is something, delirium or not, being up and moving is going to be extremely important for maintaining our health. So really, as we're thinking about delirium prevention, it's healthy aging promotion, doing uh, adequate diet and nutritional intake, hydration, exercise, so that we are aging as optimally as possible. And then if delirium does occur, that we have loved ones and a support system that can suspect it, spot it, and stop it. So with that, I want to say thank you very much for your time and attention today. Um, feel free to shoot me an email if you have any questions. Um, I'm going to open up uh, the, the Q&A and address a few questions right now. Um, so one of the questions um, is about anesthesia and delirium. So, you know, certainly the issue there is, is, an, an aging body and our rate at which we process everything. We can conceptualize aging as sort of a process of slow and low. Everything gets slower and everything happens in a lower amount. So when I take in an, an anesthesia at the age of 38, the rate that my body processes it compared to someone who's 83 is gonna be much faster. So that anesthesia stays in our body longer. Then if I'm getting in you know, an oral pain medication or something, that polypharmacy can actually trigger more of the, the delirium. And so thinking, you know, how can that be mitigated? That's a great conversation preoperatively to talk about with the surgeon, with the uh, anesthesiologist to say, I need to be on sort of the lowest dose possible for safety reasons. But a lot of the research showing um, sort of post-op, immediately post-op um, sort of outcomes really emphasizes the role of getting up and moving. So moving, walking around is going to actually start to help that acceleration of the elimination of things through your system. So the sooner you get up 
after surgery, often the better it is. Um, delirium can definitely occur in people with Parkinson's disease. Again, they sort of have the underlying medical conditions that can kind of predispose them. And, um, you know, there's also cognitive changes that occur um, in people with more advanced Parkinson's disease that do make them sort of more at risk for um, this condition. Um, so examples of sort of some speech and the, the movement manifestations that we might see in delirium. Um, Movement-wise, sort of in that hyperactive delirium, it's the person that can't sit down. They're up fiddling around with this. They're over here doing this. They just cannot calm or sit down. If they sit down for a second, their mind is saying, oh, I've got to go check on this. The house might be burning down. Let me check on the stove. Let me do this. Da, 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 da. They're, they're just always on the go. So that might be sort of our hyperactive movement pattern. Same thing with speech. They're talking a mile a minute. They just don't stop. And it is somewhat nonsensical or can be even garbled. And then our hypoactive um, can be sort of the flip of that. That's the person that is sitting on the couch. They don't make eye contact. They are just sitting like a statue. When you encourage them to get up and moving, everything is incredibly depressed and really slow. And the coordination of how do I even get out of a chair is just dampened. And so that might be sort of um, what we would look for from a movement pattern perspective, but also speech. They're going to be incredibly slow to respond, to string sort of the, the sentence together, the word finding problems. Um, so that's what we would be looking for in terms of our um, speech and movement manifestations. Um, let's see. Um, so question about sort of delirium, you know, um, and the role of sort of family support. So, you know, trauma is this sort of interesting factor and it's, it's psychological trauma, physical trauma, it's any of that um, can actually sort of lead to some delirium episodes, particularly among older adults. So in that kind of um, maybe family or household dynamics where there is a chronic stressor of another person or a loved one who might be dealing with unpredictable outbursts or anger and everything's sort of on edge, we can imagine how easily that might stress the family out. And so if I'm constantly on edge because I don't know about what my partner is going to do, my cortisol levels are getting up. And they can never go down because I can never relax because I don't know what my partner is going to be doing. I don't want to set them off. So, you know, certainly um, the question about sort of family dynamics and, and what can happen, that can absolutely happen in, in terms of having this stressful life experience and, and that never allowing your hormones to just sort of relax. So your body is always in this kind of fight or flight uh, sort of uh, experience, your hormone levels are high, your uh, inflammation levels are high, and your health is not going to be great. Um, I think that are all the questions right now. Um, so feel free to chat in any other questions um, that you might have. And Roseanne, if you have any questions, I think we've got time for maybe like one more, um, but certainly uh, if people you know, wanna reach out, uh, thanks Roseanne, mm -hmm. she put my um, email address in the Q&A. Um, so you can always reach out if there's anything else. And um, in case people missed it, the recording will be available on YouTube. So you can always go back um, and watch it then. That's great, Margaret. I just so folks know, Margaret had done a presentation to our clinical staff several months ago, and I was so delighted with the content which you saw today, so much of it. How important for all of us to be aware of 
and the overlap with mental health issues that we saw immediately and see always in our work. We're always looking at, could this be delirium rather than a mental health issue? So we just wanna be sure that everyone's aware of this and, and the significant need to have our eyes and ears open, to be watching for these signs and how to avoid and reduce the risk. Excellent. Absolutely. I mean, so, if, there, if that is the one takeaway that people have today is, unfortunately, our healthcare systems are not designed for older people. And so people that are most vulnerable actually get sometimes the worst care in our systems. So we have to be the advocates for our friends and our family to say, hey, like, I know you've got advanced medical degrees, but I know my parents or I know my spouse and this is not normal. This is an acute confusion. I need you to really investigate if they have delirium. And, mm -hmm. and it's so under detected that um, it's, it's really a shame. And so we have to be the ones to put this on their radar often because it's so easy to write the person off as saying, oh, that's just dementia or, oh, that's just depression or, oh, that's just an older person. Mm -hmm. and, and we as, as family members and as, as loved ones have to really be those doing the, the de detective legwork and being the strong advocates. Absolutely, and we so often see as social workers in the community, people coming out of the hospital with new diagnoses of dementia and Alzheimer's and, and all of a sudden new medications. So asking those questions even after the fact, why this sudden onset, what happened? So interesting. Um, I did want folks to know, absolutely, the program's recorded. It will be available. If you want a link, you can ask us for it. As well, we're going to get it on the website shortly. Um, that's why we moved to this new webinar format, so we can retain all this important information. And you can view it again or watch it with someone else, share this information. It's so important. I also wanted folks to know we have a we're gonna take a little break in September because of the holidays. We won't have an Insights on Aging program, but in October, on October 8th and on November 12th, we're gonna have a two-part series with Christy Norick, who's actually also in Margaret's department. Um, Christy's gonna be presenting on dementia, on brain function, on communication with a care partner who has dementia. It is going to be a really interesting and important program for caregivers and care partners. Um, and as well, we just want folks to know CJE Counseling Services is here. We're open for business. We're doing telehealth. We've got video sessions. We've got telephone sessions. We're slowly opening up and seeing people face-to-face, -face, but we are taking great caution in that. We're following all sorts of COVID protocols. We're limiting those to an as-needed basis, but we're here. We're willing to partner with you and figure out what your needs are. Um, so if you call 773-508-1000, that's our front door to CJE. You can get access to all of our services there, including counseling services. Um, and with that, unless you see something else in the Q&A, okay. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Margaret. What an invaluable presentation. Take Thanks care. Thanks so much everyone. for having me. Bye-bye.